Hey, it's me, Rebecca Greenfield, the host of The Paycheck. Welcome back. Last season, we looked at a lot of the reasons why women earn less than men, from illegal discrimination to the everyday workplace sexism that makes it harder for women to get raises and promotions. But one idea in particular really stayed with us, that there's one thing that hurts women's earnings more than anything else. I don't want to say that there's no sexual harassment, no gender discrimination, no bias, no absence of negotiation skills, no lack of competition for women relative to men. I never want to ignore someone's hurt and someone's stories. That's Claudia Golden. She's an economics professor at Harvard University. She's been studying women, work, and pay for decades. And she says, even if we were able to magically erase workplace discrimination, harassment, and all that other stuff, the gender pay gap would still exist. And it would still be pretty big. But I think it's extremely important to point out what the real problem is. So what is the real problem? What Claudia calls joyful events, also known as having kids. And she's got a point. Study after study has found that the gender pay gap widens to a chasm after a woman has her first child. It's true even if she continues to work full time. It's true for women at different levels of education and income. It's true even for women with same-sex partners. Over and over again, that's what the data show. It's not that women don't face discrimination or get pushed into lower paying jobs. They do. But the impact of having kids on women's earnings is way bigger. If we take a group of women who never took time off and who don't have kids, their earnings don't seem to deviate as much from men's. The gender pay gap often gets talked about as women versus men. But really, it's moms versus everyone else. We talked to a lot of moms for this season, and they'll tell you exactly why they're not making as much as men because there are only so many hours in a day. You know, I decided to work part-time so that I could spend more time with the kids. It's definitely more challenging than I would have expected, especially as my kids become more involved in extracurricular activities. But then I feel like I'm not moving my career forward right now, and I just feel really kind of stuck. I remember my colleagues sort of shit-talking somebody else who left at five, and me being like, oh, God, can I do that? In general, the office is understanding, but then um, it's disappointing when you see a comment in an annual review about how you changed your hours or took a day off unpredictably. At the same time, I feel like I should be grateful because I'm lucky that I do get to work just three days a week. I want to day at home. I have small kids. They don't have a babysitter who is just able to hang out with them. I don't have the cash for that. And what's frustrating about being a working mom? I feel like I can't be doing my best at both. I actually can't really do it all. And that weighs on me. These joyful events, it turns out, they're having not so joyful consequences. When you look at the world, you know, we're 50% of the population. Like, wh- where is our place? Like, where is our value? Women deserve equal pay for equal work. And nationwide, the median salary for men is greater than women in 99.6% of major occupations. When men have children, they experience a pay bump. When women have children, the opposite happens. When women are financially stronger, it's good for their families, it's put money into the economy, in the markets, it's good for everybody. Gender is no longer the factor creating the greatest wage discrepancy in this country. Motherhood is. For the next six weeks, we're going to investigate the impact of having kids on women's paychecks and why it's such an important part of the gender pay gap. First, we're going to take a cold economic look at that joyful event. I know, it's weird to talk about the miracle of life in economic terms, but until relatively recently, that was the full-time job for a lot of women. Because having kids was critical to the economic well-being of families and society. Those kids worked, they joined the army, bought stuff, 
But when women went to work for actual money, that turned out to be good for the economy too. When you look at American economic growth in the last century, a lot of it can be traced to women going to work en masse. But the thing is, as more women went to get paying jobs, we never stopped doing that first job. Many women now work and have kids. We call this having it all, like it's an achievement or even a choice. But when we talk about having it all, what we're really talking about is having two jobs. And as anybody who has two jobs will tell you, doing two things at once has costs. I guess I didn't realize how much work it would be and that taking care of kids would be like a full-time job that just doesn't have a salary. Balancing or managing work and family responsibilities for me has been really tricky. It's part plate spinning, part magic act, and definitely part wishful thinking. I also need coffee to make it through a day now. Prior to having children, I consumed it here and there, but I average a lot less sleep and am pretty much moving from 5.30 in the morning until 10.30 at night. Without a doubt, though, whenever I've hit a stride at work, someone at home would break a bone or have an allergy attack or get an opportunity at something that they really wanted, but which required a substantial amount of support from me. And now I'm down to 16 hours a week. And at this point, I feel like I am sort of okay. The only reason I'm able to do this is because I have a spouse who makes a decent living and he brings home the bacon. I've missed a lot. My daughter's first birthday, for example, my son's first soccer goal, uh, and I often feel mildly bad and sometimes terribly bad at all of the things that I care about. When I think about my priorities right now, it's work and kids, and my relationship comes, comes last, and there is a fallout from that. This balancing act, it has financial consequences. It's showing up in their paychecks. Gina Smilek covers economics for Bloomberg. I brought her in to tell me how exactly this plays out. Hi, Gina. Hi, Becca. So are women just getting pregnant and taking a pay cut? It's not that simple. Okay, so tell me what is happening to women's earnings over their lifetimes. So it's pretty stark. When women first start working, they're making a little bit less than men. For college-educated women, when they're 25, they're making on average 90% of what men do. But by the time they're 45, they're earning 55%, so a little bit more than half of what a man does. So men are making almost twice as much as women do by their mid-40s. That's a huge difference. Why is such a small earnings differential exploding into this big gap? It's about what happens when women are having kids. So in 2010, Claudia Golden and two other academics tested that idea in a really novel way. They studied what happened to a group of MBA students at the University of Chicago after they graduated. And so this is a group of competitive, ambitious people who all have pretty similar credentials at graduation. So you'd think that their pay would be pretty equal. Yeah. At graduation, the women in the study are earning something similar to what their classmates are making, just about 13 percent less. OK, so not exactly equal. But the thing is that it got a lot worse. So nine years later, women in this study were earning $250,000 on average. Men were making $400,000. Almost $200,000 more. Yeah, because these are high earners, the gaps are particularly big. But it's an example of what happens throughout the economy at different income levels. Okay, so we know this happens in this decade when women are in their 20s and 30s, also known as the childbearing years. So what's happening? Well, a big part of the difference seems to come from job interruptions. So time out of the workforce, a drop in hours, etc. When a woman has a child, two things happen. She takes off at least a little time for maternity leave at a minimum. But she's also more likely to work a little bit less even after that. Maybe that's a shift to part-time work, or it could just be not being on call all the time, which could matter in, for instance, a demanding consulting job. Here's Claudia again. When I say that they've taken off some time, it's not that they've taken off a lot of time. They've taken off just a small amount of time. But the penalties, it appears, for deviation in the corporate and the financial sectors are extremely large. Part of it is that if you're in iBanking, you better be working very, very long hours. 
if you're in consulting, you better be working very long hours and rather uncontrollable, unpredictable, uh, rush, on call, etc. So what happens, Claudia says, is that in almost every two-parent household, one of those parents is taking on the lion's share of child-related responsibility. In order to do that, they're having to work a little bit less. That could mean just having a hard stop at the end of the day, you know, taking time to relieve the babysitters, or taking sick days when their kids are sick. There's nothing really special about women here except that they tend to be the on-call parent. They're also the ones who are more likely to take that pay hit. Is this true everywhere? That's what the research suggests. There's a pay gap related to motherhood in many places, but it varies in magnitude. So in Denmark, for example, women who have kids do earn less, but the gap isn't nearly as large as it is in some other places. We're looking at penalties in the long run that are 50 to 100 percent larger in the UK and the US. And we're looking at child penalties in the German speaking countries that are almost three times as large. That's Henrik Klevin. He's an economist at Princeton University. And in a recent paper, he compared the pay gaps across six countries, Denmark, Sweden, the UK, the US, Austria and Germany. Those countries were all interesting to Clevin because they have different public policies for working moms. Some places have paid parental leave, others had subsidized childcare. What's interesting, though, is his research found that the differences had less to do with public policies in these given countries than they did with societal expectations for women. But we hypothesize that a lot of this has to do with differences in social norms about what men and women should do after they have kids. So what's going on is that in countries where people express a strong conviction that women with young kids should stay at home, the gender pay gap is a lot bigger. If you think about it, Germany has a lot of the same social safety nets as Denmark. Women get more than a year of paid parental leave, for instance. Yet they saw a pay gap for working moms that's three times as large. That is surprising that two places with generous policies for working women have such different wage outcomes for moms. Yeah, so that's where social norms come in. So Germany and Austria both have very traditional views on gender roles, at least based on this survey. And they also have bigger motherhood-related gender wage gaps. You look at countries in Scandinavia, so Denmark, for example, and respondents were more comfortable with women at work. And so the wage gaps in those places, although they still exist, are a lot smaller. Does that mean that public policies are completely useless? Mm, Not necessarily, but they have a surprising perk. Here's Henrik again. So it could be that policies still have an important role to play because they affect the social norm. If people are making less because they want to work less, that's their choice. But what merits further examination is if women are being forced to choose between equality and motherhood. When a culture tells women that their main job is taking care of their home and their kids, well, that's what they prioritize. When women get the message that it's acceptable and even expected that they'll work outside the home, they do that too. Which brings us back to having it all. Here's Cheryl Sandberg during the heyday of Lean In. 70% of mothers in the United States are in the workforce because they have to be. And so telling women constantly, you can't have it all, you can't have it all, is not helpful because they have to. For the last few weeks, I've been talking to women in their 20s and 30s, when their careers and prime childbearing years are just getting started. I wanted to know how ambitious women with big plans for their careers also thought about their plans to have kids. And you can hear them wrestling with these two conflicting ambitions. I see myself sometimes thinking, I would love to be a full-time mom at some point. But I think the anxiety of what if I want to return to the workforce, what does that even mean? What does that look like? I think I've always just known I've wanted to have kids. It's never been a question. But in terms of how it would affect my career, yeah, of course, it's going to hold you back from a lot of things. I was a person who delayed my first pregnancy because I was always thinking about sort of the corporate calendar. Um, I was really like, oh, if I got pregnant this month, that would be after this executive meeting before this time of year. I mean, I grew up like, I think any female grew up like with society telling them that's what they're supposed to do. You went to a good school um, and you met someone and you had a career and then you had kids. I think like if I were to be a mom, I would want to be a good mom. Um, And 
I don't think with where I'm headed, I would be able to give them the kind of time that they deserve. I'm also at this exact point in my life. I'm 30, the same age my mom was when she started her family, and just about the average age women in New York City, where I live, have their first kid. Just like these women I talk to, I'm deeply ambivalent. And it feels kind of scary to say that out loud, like I'm some heartless monster for not being 100% sure that I want to have kids or when. When I do think about it, I know from the reporting I do and the moms I know that there will be penalties. Financial, but also emotional. And that having a kid will require more compromises of me than my male partner. For a lot of women, these are good enough reasons not to have kids at all. But I'm not there yet. What I and all the other women I spoke to know in our bones is that if we want to embody both identities, have both a job, money, power, financial security, and a family, something's got to give. Because even the people who seem to embody the ideal of having it all don't. Tammy Duckworth, who lost both legs in combat, is the first disabled woman elected to Congress. She is also the first senator to give birth while in office. And today she helped make history again when her daughter was the first infant allowed on the Senate floor. Ms. Duckworth, Ms. Duckworth. From the outside, Senator Tammy Duckworth is a picture of progress. She's a U.S. senator, a war hero, and a working mother of two. She even had the Senate rules changed. So now any senator that's a working parent can bring their baby to the Senate floor. But we often spend so much time applauding Senator Duckworth's achievements that we fail to hear what she had to do to get there. So I asked her. It was tough. It was misery. Um, It was uh, just uh, hard on me, hard on my family. But I'm so, so lucky to have both my daughters and I'm so proud to be a U.S. senator. Like a lot of working women, Senator Duckworth put her career, a military career, first for a long time. She became a commissioned officer in the Army Reserves and went on to become a helicopter pilot back when it was one of the few combat jobs open to women. After she was injured in Iraq, she came home and ran for office. The first part of my career, I was on track to become a platoon leader and on track to become a company commander and um, uh, operations officer and executive officer in my Army unit. And none of those things I could pursue and take time off. Um, and mommy track and, and, and take time off to go have children. I just kept pursuing my career. And then next thing I know, I look up and I'm 36 years old. And, and what happened to my most fertile years? By the time she decided to have kids, she was 40. And by then, it wasn't so easy. My gynecologist said to me, she said, you know, this is common now. Women, we, we trade our fertility for our careers early on. Well, I didn't know when I was 40 and decided I was going to try to have kids that I would struggle with infertility for at least another six years. She had her first daughter when she was 46, and then another when she was 50. This is the point in the story where we declare she has beaten the odds in a million different ways. She has got it all. I felt like I was never good enough, whatever I was doing. When I was with my uh, my older daughter, I you know wanted to be with her, but then I felt like I was neglecting my job as I was um, campaigning for the Senate. I felt like I was leaving my daughter behind. I, and I mean, there was even one point where I broke down crying during a campaign meeting where I was just so upset and mad at my staff for switching my schedule, which meant I was going to get you know an extra 45 minutes less time with my daughter. And uh, finally, one of my staff members put me aside like, Tammy, there's no happy medium. It's just going to suck. The senator told me a story about going back to her job while she was still nursing her infant daughter. To fully appreciate it, we need to take a quick biological aside. In order to breastfeed a baby, which is what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends, a woman's body makes milk. If that milk doesn't get expressed multiple times a day, either by a baby's nursing or a press pump, everything goes south. At best, it's physically uncomfortable. At worst, it can make women sick, and their bodies will stop making enough milk to feed their babies. For working moms, that means figuring out how to fit multiple pumping breaks into your workday. Or, in the senator's case, 
a packed campaign schedule. I breastfed my, my first daughter for um, a little over a year, and I was traveling around the country, and I couldn't find a clean, safe place to express breast milk in airports. People were telling me, oh, just go use the uh, handicap stall in the public toilet, or, oh, you need to plug in your breast pump. Here, you can go use the outlet where everyone else is charging their phones. I'm like, I'm not going to sit there and pump breast milk <laughs> next to total strangers or, or you know, use the toilet. Um, that's disgusting. In 2017, Senator Duckworth wrote and passed legislation that requires all medium and large airports to have clean, private rooms where women can go breastfeed or pump while traveling. But these are the calculations working moms have to make all the time, and not just in airports, and not just when it comes to breastfeeding. Do you skip the meeting to take a pumping break? Do you leave early to pick up your sick kid? Do you work from home and miss out on important FaceTime? In 2014, toward the end of her first pregnancy, Senator Duckworth's doctor told her that she couldn't travel. It was too dangerous and would compromise her pregnancy. At the time, she had a job where her physical presence was required. She was a congresswoman and had to be at the U.S. Capitol to cast her votes. The senator asked if she could vote by proxy. Her colleagues in the Democratic Party rejected her request. They didn't want to set a precedent for everyone else who might have a doctor's note saying that they can't travel for medical reasons. They treated her like she was a worker with a rare medical emergency, not like a woman in a common and temporary biological situation. So Senator Duckworth had to miss a handful of votes. She couldn't do her job, and she's still paying for it. In the official record, Tammy Duckworth has missed 12% of roll call votes since she's been in the Senate. That's a lot more than most of her colleagues. Here's what that stat doesn't tell you. For most of those votes, she was on maternity leave. It's hard. You, you try to do everything, and, and, and you try to, um, you know, live up to that image of what a good mom is and what a you know, good worker is in the workplace. And, and I think um, women, uh, we tend to try to be perfect in everything, and, and you just can't. So you have to give yourself the room to do the best job that you can and then keep moving forward. How did we get here? And what can we do about it? Well, over the next five weeks, we're going to figure this out together. Because it turns out, research shows that kids of working moms grow into happy adults. Their daughters are more likely to have successful careers, and their sons spend more time caring for family members. Working moms are making a path toward a more equal world for their kids, even if they don't always feel like it. Next week on The Paycheck, how women get sidelined at work for being moms before they even have kids. You know, as the morning anchor, viewers want to see a beauty queen. So I'm pregnant now. I've gained like 40 pounds. I knew it would be an issue. Thanks for listening to The Paycheck. If you like this show, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to rate, review, and subscribe. The show was hosted and reported by me, Rebecca Greenfield, and reported by Gina Smilek. This episode was edited by Janet Paskin and produced by Liz Smith. We also had production help from Francesca Levy, Jillian Goodman, and Samantha Gatsik. Our original music is by Leo Sidron. Pamela Guest did the illustrations on our show page, which you can find at bloomberg.com slash the paycheck. We also want to thank The Wing for allowing us to record on site and thank all of the moms who took the time to speak with us. Francesca Levy is Bloomberg's head of podcasts.